All right, uh, tonight uh, I want to talk to you all about, about about Romans 8. A few weeks ago we talked about how the law is powerless to do anything to save us from sin. Following the rules doesn't save you. Uh, you're powerless to really do anything to stop doing evil. Sin is in our very nature. We are condemned to death by our sin. Uh, we're sentenced to live and die our sins. We're sentenced to death as long as we try and live by the rules of our own power. Romans 8, 1 reveals a very, very glorious truth. You've probably heard this verse before. There's a reason you've heard it. It says, Romans 8, 1, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Uh, you know, you've heard that word condemnation before. Um, condemnation is a, it, it, you know, you would probably think of it as a negative term, a putting down. Um, when Jesus saw the woman that was in the act of adultery and they were ready to stone her, he said, um, where are your accusers? He says that, you know, they haven't condemned you, neither do I condemn you. Um, in 1 John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he came, that, that he sent his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. But the next verse says, for the, for, for God did not come into the world to condemn the world, okay? It's, it's kind of a negative term. It means like condemn, like you're in the wrong. You're in the wrong and you're going to face the punishment, you're going to face the judgment for us, Okay. Condemnation is no longer upon those of us who are in Christ Jesus, okay? So here's the thing I want you to think of. We so often talk about having Jesus in us, having him in our hearts. Have you ever really heard about being in Jesus? We, there's a guy that I'm friends with Facebook on. He's got some weird ideas about Christianity. Um, he thinks that you still have to celebrate the feasts and some of the Old Testament. He's got some weird ideas. But one of the things that he believes is that, it, I remember he posted something one day that said, it does not say anywhere in the Bible that Jesus comes into our hearts. Well, if you read Colossians, if you read Romans, if you read some of these things, there's a connotation and implication there that Christ has come into our hearts. It's very minute verses you can miss if you just read over them like they're nothing. But the very fact he put that on there, I was like, wait a second. I mean, I get that some people think when you pray, Jesus coming into my heart, like you can pray that and nothing really changes. But it does show us in Scripture that Jesus can be in us. However, this is talking about when we are in Him. Have you ever thought of that? Have you thought about being in Christ? Are you in Jesus? Are you in His love? Are you in His grace? Are you in His mercy? Are you in His power? Are you in, are you in the right relationship with Jesus Christ? You may even remember a few weeks ago, it's probably been a couple months ago, I mentioned how we were in Adam, okay? Because of Adam we're sinful, but because of Christ we can be made free. When we were in Adam, we were abiding in death because Adam was sinful and caused death. Adam's sin caused death. Our sin causes death. Jesus' righteousness, his one righteous act has made us free. We're born of Jesus. When we're in Christ, we have life. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8, 2 says, For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. The law of sin and death is kind of what I talked about a couple weeks ago. I mean, I talked about how the law in, of Moses cannot save you. But the law of sin and death no longer has any dominion over you if you're in Christ Jesus. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit has made you free from a law that requires you to obey all the rules. That's just the law that brings death because you can't obey all the rules. There's no way with our sinful nature we can just do it all right. The law can only kill because no one can live up to that standard. It's a deadly thing because when a law says do not lust, do not lie, do not steal, and you do one of those, the only possible outcome is your punishment. And we've all already messed up. We've all already sinned. We've all already failed Christ in some way from when we were a young child. And so we need Him for that. We are set free from that, that law of death. Jesus brings life to us. Romans 8, 3 through 4 says, For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So let me explain it to you. Our flesh was weak. Our flesh talking about us, our body, our mind, our desires, who we are in this body. It, take us out of the body, take our spirit or soul out of the body. That's not our flesh. This is our flesh. We can't obey the law. The law is useless. But Jesus came. Jesus came in the same body as you. He did not come in your body, but he came in a body just like you had. A, a body uh, that, that, that could have given in to sin. A body that could have been conquered by sin. And instead, in that very same body like you live in, he conquered sin. He did what you could not do. He did what we could not do. He conquered that sin in the body. He never failed. He never sinned from the very beginning. He did what we were powerless to do. 
Rather than sin condemning Jesus to death, Jesus condemned sin. Jesus took the condemnation that we deserved upon ourselves, so we don't have to take that upon ourselves. This wasn't just to save us from hell. Jesus came to save us from sin. I've been preaching that to you. And I wish that I could know the reality of, of full freedom from sin. I want to know. Jesus came to save us from sin. He died so that we could live according to his word and his law, but not on our own power. It says that we, he came and, and died so that we could meet the righteous requirement of the law. Well, we can't meet the requirements of the law. We've already sinned. We've already failed. And yet, his righteousness can be placed upon us. Because the purpose is that we would fulfill the law. The, his purpose is that we would obey the law, although we can't in our own power. And now, if we're in Christ, we walk according to the power and leading of the Holy Spirit. Not our own opinions, not our own ideas, not our own mindsets, not our own desires. That's why I say it's so important to know the voice of God, particularly the voice of Scripture. Because the Holy Spirit leads and guides, and if we don't know what He's saying or how He's moving, then we will mess up severely. And here's the thing about this. I uh, preached a sermon like almost two years ago about hearing the voice of God. And uh, somebody, you know, Dad's video went viral and all this kind of stuff. Uh, la uh, last year, and uh, people started kind of picking on what was on YouTube, on our church's YouTube page, and that sermon happened to be on our church YouTube page, and a lady actually made a video and kind of accused me, it's about me, so if you type in uh, Micah Coverstone, I'm sure it'll pop up, uh, and she, she, or Micah Coverstone, Dana Coverstone, and she kind of, for about 20 minutes, she kind of tears apart what I say and says that God does not speak today. Well, we don't believe that. Now, God is not going to come to you and say, it's okay to commit adultery, it's okay to lie, it's okay to steal uh, from your mother in this instance. No, he's not going to say it. But he can come and he can tell you, go, stay. You know, the, you can't open up scripture and it say, you know, marry such and such, or get such and such a job. But by the leading of the Holy Spirit, you can find it. Yes, the Lord does speak today. He doesn't change what this book means, but he does lead. And we are to... Listen and follow Here it is. him. Yeah. Micah Coverstone, Daddy Coverstone's son teaches lies to youth groups. So the thing was is that like she tried to say that something I literally pulled out of scripture um, was false, but she, in saying what I said, quoted the scripture. Like she said, Micah Coverstone said that if there are no visions, uh, his students will perish. Well, that's literally what the verse says. She kind of took what I was saying out of context. But, it, it, you know, it's whatever. The, it, people are going to be like that. People are like that. We They're believe, like we believe that we walk by the, the leading of the Spirit. Romans 8, 5, for, they're, they're, listen, there's two kinds of people in the world, okay? Romans 8, 5 says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death. But to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. There are two kinds of people in the world, not black or white, not young or old. There are those who follow the flesh, and there are those who follow the Spirit. And those who follow the Spirit are a minority. When we say Spirit, I'm talking about the Holy Spirit. The ones who follow the Holy Spirit are the minority. Jesus said the gate is narrow that leads into heaven. The road is wide that leads to destruction. Fewer people make it into heaven than make it into hell. Fewer people really, truly put faith in Jesus than don't. Your mind is a battlefield of thoughts, opinions, ideas, lies, etc. A little over a year and a half ago, I did a sermon called uh, Battlefield of the Mind or something like that, or, or Mindfield. It's on, it's on YouTube too. You remember that? Cool. So, uh, that's awesome. A year and I a half. Remember, I it's remember awesome. that you talking about it. Yeah. Well, I talk about how the mind is a battlefield, and it is. Not all of the thoughts in your head are yours. I, I, I was cracking up because today I saw a video that somebody, I think somebody had sent me, and somebody commented on it. It was talking about lust and stuff and committing adultery. And somebody commented on it and said, you can't control, we can't control our thoughts, so the Bible is just a trap. And I was like, what in the world is this? What? Like, when have you not controlled? Like, there are times when, when maybe you let it become uncontrollable, but in reality, we can control our thoughts. We choose what to think about or what to keep our minds on, right? Okay? Your mind's about but not all of those thoughts are yours, though. Some of them are. Many of them are. Most of them are. But at times, some of the things that enter in our mind are the thoughts other people have placed in our mind by speaking to us about certain things. Or you've seen an ad for something or a video for something that convinces you of this, that, or the other. I had a conversation with a student at the high school today. 
that actually told me. I was reading the Bible. He's like, why are you marking it in a fancy book? And I was like, well, man, I was like, this is actually a Bible. I'm marking it so I can remember stuff and whatever. And he was like, oh, yeah. Uh, and I, I invited him to church. And he was like, uh, he was like, yeah, man. He's like, I, I, I'm not really religious. I, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious, which is kind of becoming a very common thing nowadays. He was like, I believe. Like, he, he used the word that I think was made up. But he was like, I believe that, like, there's a God, and I believe it's all real because scientists have proven that it's real. I just don't get very religious. Like, I don't get into all the sacred texts and stuff like that. That's basically how he put it. And I was like, man, that's just, that's just kind of different, you know? Uh, but somebody had obviously convinced him that God was real, but that this book didn't matter. You know, that what, what he had to say wasn't important, right? He even told me that the flood that happened in Genesis was real. And I was kind of like, well, you know, that's, that's in the Bible, <laughs> You know, but I don't think he quite got it, but I'm hoping for another conversation again at some other time. He actually happens to live across the street from me, I found out today, too. So, uh, at my new place, and I saw him walking up the road today. I know who you're talking about. Yes, you do. Uh, anyway, so your mind, all these thoughts come from different places, but ultimately you choose to have them. Okay, so these ideas sometimes pop in your head from someone else. Uh, that such and such is a good thing or that this is true, but it's a, it's a battlefield. You've got the enemy, you've got the Lord trying to speak to you, you've got uh, the, the voices of other people, and ultimately you, you decide what you think on. And, and here's the thing, if your mind is set on your own ability, your mind is set on the flesh, okay? I'm talk, when I say the flesh, I mean your own desires. The flesh is anything that is not glorifying to God, anything that doesn't follow his will, anything that doesn't follow his plan or obey him. So when you, your mind is set on your own ability, when it's I can do this or this is what I think is best, then you're, you're thinking in the flesh. There's a verse Proverbs, uh, there's a verse in Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. Um, Trust in the Lord in all your ways and lean on, in your, on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make you your path straight. Actually, I'll get the first one. Yes. Yeah, that's what so the whole point is like you're not supposed to trust in yourself in it because you will fail. You're a human. You sin. You make mistakes. You don't think right. There's even a verse in Proverbs that says there is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. Because we have the inclination, we have a vocab word you'll learn in Mr. Dodson's class. We have the proclivity and the propensity to just do wrong and to think wrong. I learned those two words when I was in high school, and I literally kid you not, the week after I learned propensity, it was on a TV show I watched. You'd be amazed how many words you just kind of gloss it over. all the time to me. You, like, you learn a word, and you're like, oh my gosh, that pops up way more than I realized. But pr that means you have, like, an inclination. You have a knack for doing that. If your mind is set on pleasing everyone else, or always pleasing yourself, your mind is set on the flesh. Sometimes we're following the flesh when we seek to serve God. And this is what I really want to spend a little bit of time talking about. Sometimes we are following the flesh when we seek to serve God. We try to determine what God wants us to do rather than actually seeking Him for an answer of what we ought to do or looking to the Scriptures to find what we ought to do. I'll give you a perfect example. How many of you know what VeggieTales is? Or you've heard of it at least. VeggieTales, VeggieTales it's an old, old Christian you know, show. Phil Vischer was the guy that created the characters. Phil Vischer and Mike Nalrocky, y'all can put, put down your hands. Uh, but Phil Vischer was the guy that made it, okay? Phil Vischer created these characters, and you know that when I was a kid growing up, I thought he was still over it, probably up until I was probably 15. I didn't even realize what had happened, but when I was probably about four or five years old, when VeggieTales had only been about nine or 10, 11 years old, he lost the company. Okay, he lost the entire company. Every VeggieTales thing that's been produced since, he does voices for, but he doesn't have any creative oversight. He can't write the stories, any of that kind of stuff. They're owned by other people. They're properties of, uh, of other organizations. And he talks about, I read his, his, his biography about it. And I, I, he talks about how he realized, like, through the whole process of losing his company, like, he thought, God, how could you let this happen? Like, I made these characters for you. I did this for you. I wanted people to find out about you. I wanted to teach people what Scripture said. I did this all for you and for your glory, God. And then he found that verse, Proverbs 28, 19. Where there is no vision, the people perish. That very verse that that woman was kind of using in that video to say I was wrong. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Now, here's the thing. Nowadays in leadership, and you hear some of your superintendents and people say it all the time, leaders and principals, pastors, we got to have a vision for the future. And last year everybody was saying, this year I've got 20-20 vision. And then it turned out in COVID, you know? And it was just really, really bad. 
But we say vision, vision, vision. When people say vision, they say, I've got to have a plan. That's what vision means for them. I've got to have a plan for the future. What I want my goals to be. What I want to happen in this organization. But in, if you actually read scripture, you'll find out that, the, that it, vision is what it says in the King James. Well, back in that day, vision would have meant more like revelation. In some of your more modern translations, it says, where there is no revelation, the people perish. A revelation is a revealing. A revelation means God revealed to you. So, if you choose to do something on your own power, you haven't had anything revealed to you, you'll make mistakes. You'll fail. And Phil Vischer learned that lesson. He realized, you know what, I made these characters for God, but I never asked God his opinion. I never sought God for what he wanted me to do with my life. I never looked to him to direct my paths. I never looked at scripture and said, this is, this is my guidebook. Instead, I decided that I knew what was best. And that was some animated characters that would teach kids not to lie or steal. That is walking in the flesh. That's the perfect example of walking in the flesh. You know why so many of the things we do as churches fail? And I believe this to this day. I'll believe it for years and decades to come. The reason so much we do in churches fails is because we do it in the flesh. We just up and decide, this would be a great... I, I want to do a podcast. I want to do a podcast. You know, I'm a youth pastor. I got all this free time. I want to do a podcast... But maybe that's not what the Lord has for you. Or in a lot of our events, you know, they're done in the flesh, right? We say, oh, I just think it would be a great idea if we did a lock-in. I just think it would be a great idea if, um, if we had a refrigerator in the youth. I just think it would be a great idea if our method of reaching people with gospel was to give them a water bottle at the city park during a ball game and get them to come, okay? All of those are not terrible or wrong things. But when we do them because we think they're best, we are walking in the flesh. When we have our own ideas and we don't consult the Lord, when we don't listen for His direction, we're walking in the flesh and not in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit will lead, but a lot of times we're just listening to our own voice. A.W. Tozer said something along the lines of this. I'm probably going to butcher what he said. But he said... The reason we do not hear from God is we have decided, we have already decided we're not going to do what he says. The reason we do not hear from God is we have already decided we're not going to do what he says. That is walking in the flesh. That is walking according to what we think is best. Man, if we just had uh, three or four guitars on stage, more people would come to church. If we just had, if the sound was better, if we just put this big banner out front, if we do a bunch of live videos... Don't get me wrong, if the Lord directs you to do such things, it's okay, it's, it's right to do those things. But so many times our failure as a church has been to do what we think is best and not seek the Lord. And that is walking in the flesh. We can walk in the flesh while trying to please God. We can try to please God while walking in the flesh. It happens. We choose our own idea of what's best. And it fails us. The worries of the world and flesh only bring death. They only bring anger, frustration, fear, worry, regret. But the Spirit, the things of the Spirit bring peace to one's life. Philippians 4, 6 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And we, this is, that's a verse that people a lot of times quote. I quote it. When I don't know what to say to somebody, and they, like, their puppy died or something, and they need some peace in their heart, like, I quote Philippians 4, 6, but then I also add verse 7 to it, which a lot of people miss. Because verse 7 is what happens if you do verse 6. It says, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So when I know somebody needs peace, when Hema, when, when my wonderful fiance needs peace, you know what I tell her? I say, I, I quote this verse, I say, look, prayer and supplication, seek God. That's the only way to get peace because there's a peace being in His presence. Tell me, when do you feel the most peaceful in your life? It's probably when we play worship music in here and we, we pray, right? And, 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 or, or we just worship. That is a very peaceful time. Why? Because praying, supplicating, giving thanksgiving to the Lord brings peace. If your mind is set on anything but what the Holy Spirit desires for you and other things, your mind is in opposition to God. It literally says, I just read it a minute ago, in verse 7, For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. It cannot. If you are trying to serve God and you are choosing to do it by your own power, your own ability, if you think 
if you just at a staff meeting or board meeting of the church one day, maybe you're a, maybe you'd be a missionary, a pastor, a board member, Sunday school teacher, and you just say, I just think the best idea that I've had. We're gonna do like this big Easter egg hunt, and all the kids in town are gonna come, and we're gonna get our kids ministry boosted up. Woo we? Maybe not a bad idea, but here's the thing: if you're doing it according to your own idea and you haven't sought the Lord, well, guess what? You're actually acting in hostility to God. You're actually acting in opposition to God. You're actually acting in a way that defeats God's purpose, so to speak. And it says in verse 8, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. If your mind's set on ungodly things, you can't submit to God. You can't please God. Here's the thing. Have you ever wondered why some people are so hostile to Christianity? Why does something that is wrong in any way, that, I'm sorry, something that is not wrong in any way upset believers, unbelievers, I'm sorry, because their mind cannot submit to the right things? I'll give you an example. Uh, and you all will know what I'm talking about, but I'm, I'm not going to say it outright because I'm on video, um, and, and so... Those of you that watch this sermon, whenever you watch it on YouTube, I'm not saying names, but the students here know what I'm talking about. So, per perfect example of a situation, okay? So, say a couple wants to have a wedding, and they don't want alcohol to be present at the wedding, and that's a, you know, that's a great thing, right? We, you know, he's a youth pastor, uh, they, they, they want to honor God by not having anything at their wedding, uh, but somebody gets mad because they just cannot help but have one alcohol at the wedding. Why? What's so wrong with saying we don't want somebody leaving our wedding drunk and getting in a wreck? Just this week I was uh, sitting in the classroom at the high school and uh, the teacher was showing um, a video of, uh, a, a, of a girl that had been about 17 days after I was born. It was in 99. Um, there was a girl that had been in a wreck because a guy drank one Saturday night and he drove home and he wrecked into a car that had five people in it. Two of them died, two of them lived, well three of them lived, but one of them that lived was so burned, you couldn't even, I mean she just, you've seen those videos and pictures, right? You couldn't even see who she was. And it was a beautiful girl and then all of a sudden just nothing. Just nothing but ugliness. And, and I don't say that to be mean, like, I, I, like genuinely, like all she ever would get from that point on were looks. And we say, well we don't want somebody leaving. Our wedding and doing that. We don't want somebody, uh, if, the only, if they can't have fun at our wedding without drinking, well, we, you know, we don't want that, right? Why is it that somebody can get so, so angry when that's the decision you make? I mean, there's nothing wrong with it, we, right? We, 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 the people, they, they do it in good standing. They do it for a good reason. But somehow, some way, somebody can't accept that truth. Why? Because those who are in the flesh cannot please God. They cannot submit to God. That is why there is so much hostility. You know, some people say if Christians acted more like Christ, the world would be saved very soon. And I believe that to a degree. I really do. But I think sometimes people use that as an easy out to say you should just love your neighbor and not speak against sin. Right? Because everybody has their skewed own opinion of who God is and who Jesus was. Uh, but in reality, you go to some of these nations and these Christians will not even fight back when people come to kill them, and yet they still kill them. Why? Why do they hate people that aren't even going to throw a punch back? Why do they hate them so much? It's the right thing. It's what Jesus said to do. He said, turn the other cheek. I mean, why do people hate us so much? Why are people so hostile when we choose to do the right things? Because those who are in the flesh cannot submit to God. They can't do it. It's impossible without the help of God. The perfect example is Jesus. Why did Jesus face so much Opposition. He was perfect. He never did a thing wrong. Sometimes he would just tell the truth as it was and it made other people angry. Why? Well, because those who are in the flesh cannot submit to God or the will of the Holy Spirit. 1 John 5, 14 says, And this is the confidence that we have towards him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. We set our minds on the things of the Spirit when we pray according to his will. I really believe that. The Spirit enables us to pray God's will. One of the things I, I say often is, is pray what's in Scripture. When somebody, I think I brought this up last week a little bit, but when somebody is not saved, and I begin to pray for them, I always pray, okay, God, Scripture tells us, in the New Testament, Scripture tells us that it is not your will that any should perish. You tell us that, and I can't remember if it's First or Second Peter, but in one of them he says that. It's not God's will that any should perish, okay? 
And then this verse says, if we pray anything according to his will, he hears us. So I say, okay, God, even if I'm the worst sinner, I can't be right now, even if I failed you in every way, like, I know it's not your will that such and such goes to hell. It's not your will that they perish. And if I pray your will, you'll hear me. So God, I pray that they don't perish. I pray that you save them. I pray that you deliver them from sin. I pray that you make them new. I pray that you give them a new heart, a new uh, mind, a new soul, a new, a new, uh, a new life. Because when we pray the will of God, that is a way in which we are living by the Spirit. And our mind can be set on the things of the Spirit when we pray that way. The last few verses of Romans, uh, of the passage particularly that I'm talking about in Romans 8 is, You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. That's very, very important theology right there, you've got to understand. If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. At the beginning of this chapter I said, I talked about how you are in Christ, you are in Jesus. There's great importance placed on that, on being in Jesus, in Christ. Now the attention is turned the opposite way at the end of this particular passage. We are told that we are walking in the Spirit if the Spirit is in us. If Christ be in you, we are to be in Jesus Christ and He is to be in us. It works both ways. If the Holy Spirit lives in you, you cannot be living in the flesh. Here's the thing where, where Pentecostals and some people differ. And this is why there's a lot of confusion there. Pentecostals believe that pretty much any real Orthodox Christian out there believes that when you're saved, the Holy Spirit comes and seals you. That the Holy Spirit does a work in you. There's, there, if, if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit, there wouldn't be a, a believer in the world. There wouldn't be a Christian in the world. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit all have a, a part in salvation, okay? We believe there's kind of a second experience, so to speak, of what the Holy Spirit can do. We believe the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in us, but then we also believe that it fills us and baptizes us. That, that the Holy Spirit, not, not, not yet, I'm sorry, He baptizes us, fills us. Well, Jesus baptizes us with the Holy Spirit, okay? So if the Holy Spirit lives in you, if you're saved and you are baptizing the Holy Spirit, as we say, with the evidence of speaking in tongues, healing miracles, the power, the boldness, the praying, whatever it is, uh, you still cannot be living in the flesh because the Holy Spirit dwells inside you. The Holy Spirit changes your attitudes. It changes your behavior. It changes your actions. It changes your thoughts. The Holy Spirit will purify you and work through you. This verse also speaks to the Spirit of Christ. Okay, I can't really tell you. I haven't done enough research into the thought to understand it, but there's a difference between the Spirit of Christ and the Holy Spirit. It says Spirit of Christ at one point. There's a differentiation there for a reason. Christ lives in you if you belong to Him. If He does not live in you, you do not belong to Him. So that, that friend of mine on Facebook that I said says that it's not about Jesus coming to your heart. He might be right to an extent that it never explicitly states in Scripture that ask Jesus into your heart. Okay, it doesn't say that. But what it does say is if Christ is not in you, if, if, if the Spirit of Christ is not in you, you don't belong to Him. To Jesus. You don't belong to God if He's not in you. If He is not in you, you don't belong to Him. And that's the reality you have to understand. That if, if Christ is not in you, in your heart, in your mind, in everything about your being, he, you're, you don't belong to Him. You're not His child. All that doesn't matter. If, if Christ isn't living in you, you're probably walking in the flesh. No, you are walking in the flesh because you can only walk by the Spirit if you follow the Spirit's leading. The only way you can follow the Spirit's leading is if you have Christ in you, if you have the Holy Spirit in you, leading you and guiding you. You ever just had that gut feeling and you knew something and you knew you had to do it and it turned out that you were right? Sometimes the Holy Spirit leads us. Now, sometimes we're wrong with our gut feeling. Sometimes we're wrong with what we think. A great example of the Holy Spirit's leading is if you ever, I know you all don't like to read, but I'm telling you, once you really start to read Scripture, you'll learn that there's a lot of other books that are great out there that, that reinforce the ideas in this book. And one of those is The Cross and Switchblade by David Wilkerson. David Wilkerson died just about 10 years ago this year. And he out of a car wreck. He was the guy that started Teen Challenge every year. And 
those of you that attend on Sunday mornings will probably remember this. Every year in May, typically, we have some ladies come and they do like skits and stuff and like they, they, they talk about their testimony of being free from drugs and all this other stuff. That is Teen Challenge, okay? Teen Challenge was started by David Wilkerson, who went to the streets of New York just following the Spirit's leading. It's an incredible story about what happened and how God led him to go to New York and start this organization, reach out, and millions, I'm not going to say millions, not millions, but thousands upon thousands of people over the past 60 years have benefited from that ministry. Not just benefited from it, but been saved, been redeemed, been made new. Drugs have been out of the system. They've been freed from pornography and, and drugs and whatever it is, any, any of those sort of addictions, all because he followed the Spirit. He didn't sit and pray for hours on end and say, Oh God, just tell me what I need to do and give me this sign if I'm supposed to go. He just trusted in the Lord in that moment that this is what I need. He knew when the Spirit was speaking to him. And there are times when you're going to need to pray for an answer because it doesn't come as clear. But there are other times when the Spirit can lead you in a moment to say and to do what needs to be done. And you've seen that work sometimes here in these contexts, maybe at camp, maybe at a church service. There are times when people walk in the Spirit that don't always walk in the Spirit all the time. There are, there are times when people... Uh, I should say walk in the Spirit. When people follow the Spirit's leading, that don't do it at all times. Here's the thing. It's the Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. It is the same Holy Spirit that can give you life and power to live as God wills. Think about that. The Holy Spirit that lives inside you is the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. There's a Jeremy Camp song that speaks of this. The same power. Look, look up Same Power by Jeremy Camp. The same power that rose Jesus from the grave. And talks about how that, that same power, the Holy Spirit lives inside of me. 